Hello and welcome to the next episode of Resident Evil 3 Nemesis LP. And, uh... Oh, hey, I'm... I'm actually skipping stuff this time around. Well, yes. Yes, I am skipping stuff this time around. So, this playthrough will be rather fast. I'm not speedrunning the game or anything like that. But I will be skipping most cutscenes, apart from, you know, variations of old ones that I haven't shown yet. And the unskippable cutscenes, like this particular one. Um, also, I'll be skipping all the door animations, something that you can do on the PC version, as I've shown before. I'm also using the bonus weapons and infinite ammo that we've unlocked last time in Men's Mercenaries. Um, essentially, this is how the game plays for you when you unlock everything in the game and just want to have some nice relaxing zombie killing action. Oh, and um, in addition, the gimmick, so to speak, of this run is that I fail all the live selections. I choose nothing. I wait for the time to run out. It's not something that you normally do in the game, so even those who played the game might not know what happens if you do that. And it's kind of interesting, so I just, I, I just want to show it off. And as for the commentary, I will mention a few things about what you see in the run, but we'll mostly talk about the development of the game and the story that was made for this game, uh, which you might not get just from playing the game. Anyway, sadly, all the unlocks, including the infinite ammo, aren't toggles in Resident Evil 3, so once you unlock them, you can't actually disable them on the same save file. And on PC this actually means that you cannot disable them at all, without changing or deleting one line in the configuration file of the game, as all the unlocks are just permanent otherwise. You can play around with that line and disable and enable the unlocks by like deleting and adding back the line, but be careful as if you added the epilogue unlocks, you might actually break the special secret message that you get after unlocking all the epilogues. I know because that happened for me. Um, you will see it in the next episode, I actually had to redo stuff. Um, now, as you might have noticed already, I'm actually running around with a giant minigun. It's slow, and you can't aim up or down, but you don't need to. It just hits everything anyways. I will show the clear difference between the Gatling gun and the assault rifle in just another video, but in general the idea is that minigun hits harder and more enemies at once, so... In most cases, it's a faster option, despite the fact that it does have a slow aiming animation and it needs to spin up before firing. Um, I'm also carrying the rocket launcher. I'm having it just for the boss fights, essentially. I, I could put it in the item box until needed, but I kind of wanted to show off the fact that if you just run like this, you don't really need to use item boxes in the game. Um, uh, apart from the very first one that you open, obviously. But... Well, I will be using item boxes because, you know, in this run I am trying to show off some stuff that I haven't shown. Um, obviously you can use a rocket launcher at anyone, not just the bosses, and it, it just explodes them in a pretty nice way. But it's usually a pointless overkill. It's slow, also cannot be aimed up or down and has a really long recovery animation, so the only really good use is against Nemesis or the Gravedigger. I will also be using the Assault Rifle at times, as it is faster a safer option for some enemies. For example, trying to use something like Gatling Gun against Hunters when they are close to you is pretty much suicidal, you won't be able to shoot them. They're way too fast. Um, so you need something faster, and even if it has less stopping power, the Assault Rifle can be a very good option. Uh, especially since you unlock it from the start with the Mercenaries. I mean, obviously I have infinite ammo for everything, so I could just use, you know, Grenade Launcher with Freeze Rounds, or, or Magnum, or something, but, you know, I'm showing off the unlocked weapons, so why not do that? 
So anyway, here's the first life selection. I'm not choosing anything. And this is what happens. It just puts me in a very dangerous place. Uh, because Nemesis hits you right after you fail a selection. The interesting thing about it is that not a single life selection in the game can actually kill you. None of them. Even here, if I had zero health, and zero health, uh, you're not dead with zero health, you're dead with uh, the negative health in Resident Evil games, at least the early ones. Even if I had zero health, I would still survive that punch. I have no idea if that's a trick about that specific punch, because I do know that uh, Nemesis punches can kill you, actually, in the game. He usually does the finisher, but he can kill you with his punch. Uh, but maybe it's just how the life selection is set up to work in the game, so... Like, whatever happens right after it doesn't kill you. But then I do know that one single selection, what happens right after it, can kill you, so... Hmm, I don't know. I guess this is just a very special one because it's the first one, but again, none of the life selections themselves ever kill you. And uh, I will be showing it off in the final episode, actually. So, um, we got the basics out of the way, and uh, right now we're going to see the Rondor <laughs> in the Raccoon City. Police department, this one. And this door is actually correct in uh, in PlayStation versions. I think I mentioned this before, but um, I completely forgot that it, it was basically wrong just for PC version or something like that. Um, let's talk about the development of Resident Evil 3 now. Now, one of the sources, the, basically the main source for all the information that I got on Resident Evil 3 development, uh, was the Project Umbrella fan, fan site. Uh, it's a fantastic Resident Evil fan site, and they had a chance to interview Yasuhiro Kawamura, who was the Resident Evil 3 scenario writer in 2012. Uh, I even translated that interview into Russian in my blog once. It's it's a really, really cool read, so I will be adding a link <clears throat> to that interview in the video description. You, you definitely should check it out, but I will basically tell the same story, but in my own words. So, not a lot of people know about it, but Resident Evil 3 also had different uh, scrap versions in development. It's not as known as Resident Evil 2 Project, you know, the one that's usually called Resident Evil 1.5. Um, and, oh, I'm actually showing off that you can get Magnum there. That's... I'm actually glad that this happened, because it's a rare thing. Anyway... Um, so... It's less known that Resident Evil 1.5. It's less known than a lot of versions of Resident Evil 4, like the Hookman, the Castle version, or the Fog, I think the Hookman was called. But... Resident Evil 3 actually had a different kind of different versions of it. In a manner of speaking, several completely different projects were competing, you can say, to be the third official Resident Evil. So, the idea is that Right after releasing Resident Evil 2, Capcom started planning the next game in the series, obviously. Uh, there was a call for potential employees to work on the so-called Biohazard Next project. And at the same time, the main team from Resident Evil 2, led by Hideki Kamiya, uh, started working on what was supposed to be Resident Evil 3. Now, if you were a fan of Resident Evil, in late 90s or early 2000s, you probably, you just had to hear the rumors about the Resident Evil game where you play as Hunk, as the main protagonist. And apparently those rumors originated from this project that Hideki Kamiya team was doing. Because in it, um, Hunk was supposed to be the main character, 
on the cruise liner in the ocean, apparently trying to acquire a sample of G-Virus, which I guess would put the canonicity of the fourth survival from Resident Evil 2 into question, at least back when this project was in development. By now it's probably considered canon again, but maybe back then they wanted to change that in some way. But anyway, after getting several new team members for this next project, this new team headed by Kazuhira, uh, Kazuhira Aoyama, who was the event and level designer on the first two Resident Evil games, started working on their own spin-off Resident Evil title. The project back then was even named accordingly, it was called Gaiden. Uh, that project was supposed to be considerably smaller in scale, probably closer in quality to the later released uh, Resident Evil Survivor actually. We won't know now, but it was supposed to be a really small scale thing. And it was supposed to tell the story or stories of uh, survivors from Raccoon City as they try to escape the events that we already know about from Resident Evil 2. Now, unlike the main major titles in the series, for which the story was usually handled by Flagship, it's a company with which uh, Capcom was partnered for the stories for the scenario writing, uh, Yasuhira Kawamura was tasked with writing up the story for this Gaiden project. So, as such, we have four, at least, four known Resident Evil projects in development at the same time, with each having a potential to be the third game in the series, even if it wasn't supposed to be called Resident Evil 3. So we have Hideki Kamiya Handed Project, which was the intended Resident Evil 3. Uh, we have Resident Evil Zero, which was already in development for Nintendo 64. We have Code Veronica project, which was in development in a completely other Capcom division uh, and was, as far as I know, already in development specifically for Dreamcast. And we have this small-scale Gaiden project that was supposed to be just a spin-off for PlayStation 1. And then one day everything changes. Solid information on PlayStation 2 gets released, and everyone in Capcom knows that Hideki Kamiya's Resident Evil 3 project is going to be a PlayStation 1 project, it's developed as a PlayStation 1 project, but by the time they can release it, the market will be all about PlayStation 2, so this new potential huge hit for the Capcom will be on a platform that is outdated. So, Resident Evil Zero was experiencing serious issues in development, and now we know that it actually had to change the platform laser from Nintendo 64 to GameCube, and was released only in 2002. Code Veronica was also far from being made back then, and Again, it was released already in PlayStation 2 era, as we know now. And they needed a really good Resident Evil re released before PlayStation era ends. And they didn't want to put out another Director's Cut or DualShock release or something like that, because this could potentially damage the relationship with the series fans, who already had to play some re-releases instead of new games several times. So, the small-scale Gaiden project was uh, decided to be rescaled into a full-on main title in the series. Now, the project was still not officially named Resident Evil 3. In fact, apparently it was usually informally called Resident Evil 1.9, because the first half of the events of the game were even back then supposed to happen before Resident Evil 2. Uh, so, it was given a bigger budget, a bigger team, and set on a specific schedule to be released as the final PlayStation 1 main Resident Evil game. At the same time, Kamiya's project was scrapped, and his team was given a new project, uh, the Biohazard 4 project, 
be designed specifically for PlayStation 2 hardware. Now, as we know today, that project, often informally known as Stylish Biohazard, would actually later be redesigned as well into a completely new game called Devil May Cry. Uh, which would become the first in the new successful game franchises for Capcom. But the previously known Gaiden needed some redesigning to be a proper main game. So instead of having just some unknown survivors that were planned regionally, something, someone from the main cast of characters was selected. Uh, basically all other main characters were taken for other projects, so it was decided Jill Valentine is supposed to be the main character of the game. Uh, and it was also decided to destroy Raccoon City by the end of the game, which would also serve as a kind of symbolism for the end of the original era, PlayStation 1 era of the series. Now, interestingly enough, even though the project was given a much bigger scale, uh, the scenario writing was still left in the hands of Kawamura-san. While he initially, he initially had some crazier ideas for it, like an even bigger crossover with the events of Resident Evil 2, and ability to meet up with Leon and Claire, these beats were cut out to keep the story of the games, at least up till then, and for the projects that were already in development, more consistent. Uh, and while there was some involvement from Flagship in the project, they apparently didn't contribute a lot to the scenario, and a lot of what was written by Kawamura-san was left as is, which is really strange for the main series of Resident Evil until the most modern titles in the series, because Flagship handled the scenario writing of all of the main Resident Evils up and like for, for the longest time. So apart from the potential story bit cuts, a uh, few things were changed or cut a bit from the game to enhance the pacing. Um, as such, it is widely known that several puzzles or puzzle stages were cut from the first half of the game. Some of the objects can still be found in the game code, uh, something that you can check on more online. There are even videos of people like hacking those uh, items in your inventory. Uh, for example, there was a chain item with unknown use. Uh, the fire hose that you need to <clears throat> dose out the fires uh, was actually a two-part item. You had to be... it had to be combined. And uh, one of the items was supposedly found in the same uh, location where you find the fire hose now, while the second part of the hose was probably found uh, in that fire escape uh, ladder, uh, where the map is and two herbs in the beginning section of the game, in the same location with the uh, entrance to the bar and boutique. Uh, you can see. Uh, a special place for the fire hose there. Um, also, the remote that you used to get the code for the umbrella sales office backdoor uh, was supposed to like batteries originally, which had to be found elsewhere. It is unknown where, actually. Uh, and uh, there were also some strange coin items with completely unknown use, like different colored coins you could put somewhere, maybe a jukebox or something. Um, now, some of these things might have been... Oh, and this, this cutscene, this variation of cutscene we haven't seen, so let's check it out right now. Carlos! No! Relax, I'm not dead yet. Are you okay? I'm fine. Uh, that hero stuff is harder than it looks.
Ouch, my ears are ringing. We both should be deaf by now. Okay, I'm gonna scrounge up some equipment. There might not be any at our destination. So, yeah, we haven't actually seen this particular variation of the cutscene where uh, you meet up with Carlos as this stuff is blowing up, but he's still not seen in the CGI cutscene, as you could see. Um, it's just an option. It doesn't really add anything particularly interesting. But it's fun nonetheless. So, anyway, uh, some of the things that, uh, that were cut might have even been present in the earliest trade show demo copies of the game uh, that Capcom was showing to the public, but they're all cut in the finished version. And uh, to be completely honest, I'd say it was for the best because it did improve the pacing of the game. No! Now, we do not know at the moment what happened with the Kamiya-headed Biohazard 3 project. It was cancelled, but we don't know at which stage if there was anything playable done for it, if we can see anything, if anything can like pop up in the internet someday. But what we do know is that Capcom would try to revisit the idea of the cruise ship Resident Evil several times. Now there was the project called, ironically, Resident Evil Gaiden, uh, which was a non-canon game for Game Boy, which sees Barry and Leon fighting zombies on a cruise ship. Then we had Resident Evil Dead Aim, the fourth project in the Survivor series, which combined third-person and first-person perspectives in really unexpected ways, and was ironically released on PlayStation 2 uh, to be the only fully single-player Resident Evil to be released on the platform until the a uh, slightly downgraded port of Resident Evil 4 a few years later. And finally we had Resident Evil Revelations, which was the most successful attempt at the idea so far, and also kind of ironically, which had Jill Valentine as the main character. So basically all three attempts uh, were somehow related to Resident Evil 3 project development. Um, also, so far, we haven't seen Hunk in any canon appearance since the fourth Survivor. Uh, he was mentioned once in some file, I believe in Code Veronica, but that's it. Um, oh, and also, apparently, uh, Shinji Mikami was strongly against Resident Evil 3, that I'm playing right now, uh, to be called Resident Evil 3, and he preferred for it to stay 1.9 or something along the lines, because he felt that uh, the game was not a proper sequel to be named Resident Evil 3, and apparently he still regrets that the game is called Resident Evil 3. Given my love of this game, I, I think I should comment on, on that, what I think about this opinion Shinji Mikami has. So yeah, um, anyway, as for the story reading for Resident Evil 3, it's a pretty interesting extension of Resident Evil 2's story with a slight change of uh, canon. As most main Resident Evil games tend to slightly change small bits of previously known or more often implied stories to feed the needs of this new game in making, uh, it wasn't anything new even back when Resident Evil 3 was developed. Uh, for example, progenitor virus concept was just changed into something we know now from Resident Evil 5 from the early idea of clay virus. As Code Veronica and Zero ideas were being written at the same time, the full concept of how T-Virus was developed was formed. So for Resident Evil 3, Kawamura-san created a concept of competition within the Umbrella Corp itself, uh, something that was only hinted about in Resident Evil 2 with uh, William Birkin's fate. Oh, and also right now uh, I'm going to show off something that we... that you might not know. Uh, 
that if you fail as a selection and for some reason you can't actually kill the zombies through the fence, despite the fact that they actually auto aim at you through the fence. But here's Nemesis! Did not expect that, huh? I was actually surprised at the moment because I only thought that Nemesis could spawn here only if you escape from the back door. But no, apparently if you if you fail at life selection, Nemesis still spawns uh, when you exit from the only available door. So that's an interesting thing. Um, anyway, back to the story. So after Alexia suddenly disappeared. And Dr. Marcus died, as we later learn he was actually murdered by William Burton and Albert Wesker, as it was shown in Resident Evil Zero. Uh, Burton's research in T-Virus was completed based on the Marcus's leech research, and as such, Burton and Chicago branch of Umbrella Corporation, which he was head of, uh, became the most influential uh, part of the company, essentially. T-Virus was viewed as the most important development for the company and his success put a lot of attention and strain on the Chicago branch and also basically created a rivalry between it and the European branch of Umbrella who immediately decided to find ways to create the best POW based on T and uh, outdo the Chicago branch. Uh, while they had experiments uh, while they did experiment uh, with some enhancements to the Hunter BOW, and uh, by the way, both Beta and Gamma Hunters that we see in Resident Evil 3 were actually brought into Raccoon for research from the European branch. They were developed in the European branch of Umbrella. Uh, their most interesting idea was working with the newly found Parasite, which was named Nemesis Parasite. Unlike the later series Plugger's Parasite, this particular Parasite didn't strive to, so to speak, outlive or outdo the host, uh, as its own mind was really simple. Instead, it needed the host's brain powers to enhance its own. As Kalamura-san puts it, it would work as kind of a dual-core CPU. So it also allowed any BOW paired with Nemesis Parasite to receive the control commands, to follow orders, essentially. And as such, the monster known as the Pursuer or Nemesis was created from the uh, common model of the Tyrant and the Nemesis Parasite. And it was sent to Raccoon City with the goal to kill everyone who ruined the plans of the Chicago branch and kind of shown how much more effective European branch is as they're cleaning up uh, someone else's mess. But going back a bit in the story, um, after the events of the Spencer's mentioned in Resident Evil 1, uh, Birkin was uh, tired and stressed in his research and uh, with his new big project, the G-Virus, and he became more and more paranoid at times. Uh, his G-Virus, which for Resident Evil 3 story was planned to be also known as God Virus, which is pretty interesting because it was supposed to create uh, essentially a new breed of human beings, the G-Humans, who uh, would have a very specific kind of mutation and would be able to breed and live like uh, a new dominant species on the Earth. Something that actually goes in line with the Spencer's vision of the future, as we later learn in Resident Evil series. Uh, but by now it might be a retconned idea, because we never actually heard this being mentioned since then. Um, uh, but anyway, the G-Virus project uh, created a lot of buzz within Umbrella, and uh, Birk it was demanded from Birkin to finish his development as soon as possible and produce the stable version of G-Virus to Umbrella. 
which led Birkin to suspect that given how Spencer's mentioned events were technically under his responsibility, uh, since he was the leader of the this branch, he will probably become a scapegoat for the everything bad that happens, and that the company will try to get rid of him when they get the G-Virus. So instead, he decided to bargain with the US government and promise to provide them with the old BOW and virus data if they can get him out of the situation he found himself in. Knowing that this will get known, it, it won't be a secret for long, essentially, he also decided to start sabotaging Raccoon City from within, to kind of barricade under the city in the, in the laboratory and wait for the extraction. Uh, it was under his orders, uh, waste disposal facilities started pumping out uh, the unhealthy amounts of biocontaminated waste and uh, thus started the infection that will in several weeks cover the entire of Raccoon City. But as we know from Resident Evil 2, before the full-on outbreak happened, a group of Umbrella operatives, including Hunk, uh, did infiltrate the Raccoon Underground Lab and confront Birkin. As a result of that, Birkin had to inject himself with an unstable version of G-Virus thus not becoming the G-Human, but rather a mutating monstrosity that would try to breed in attempts to create a perfect version of itself, so to speak. And in the ensuing fight with the Umbrella operatives, uh, he wiped pretty much all of them out. And most of the T-Virus pure concentrated samples got destroyed and contaminated the sewers and the rats living in it, which basically became the reason for the full-on contamination of the city very soon afterwards. And uh, here I want to point out that the life selection we're seeing right now um, actually does hurt you. And again, I, I have a damage table that I've shown late, uh, last time, and I will talk about it later. But, as you can see here, I'm severely damaged after failing this life selection. But, uh, and this life selection can actually put you in like, no health. Well, almost no health. But it cannot kill you, ever. So, this is something that I want to point out, that even the life selection that has uh, failing it clearly damaging gel it still won't kill you at any point in game. Um, also, I seem to not know that you can actually shake off the sliding worms before they start, start full-on sucking you. Something that I learned later. I never knew about this for some reason. But anyway, back to the story again. So, in the ensuing chaos, uh, several things happen. US government, who were ready to extract Birkin and the data, sent in their troops anyways to get the data, no matter what. But a lot of those troops actually get wiped out uh, in a huge fight with tyrants outside the disposal facility. Uh, we see this right in the end of the game. Um, officially, troops are also sent to contain the outbreak, but after several days or weeks of attempts, it becomes clear that the city is lost and uh, those get in order to withdraw in full, including the barricades around the otherwise mostly deserted anyway raccoon outskirts, uh, which is supposedly how Leon and Claire get in the city without any kind of warning signs of barricades, because they actually got in the window during which uh, the military uh, has withdrawn. So, at the same time, Umbrella officially sends in their own UBCS troops, uh, officially to clean up the mess and help the survivors in the city, but in actuality to get the data <clears throat> and uh, the G-Virus sample, because 
Back then they didn't know that Hunk survived and uh, can provide them with G-Virus. Um, but those also get almost entirely wiped out. They had a lot of experience but they never expected to find literally hundreds of thousands of infected citizens in the city, uh, including actual BOWs. And finally, Umbrella also sends the Tyrants, while European branch uh, airdrops Nemesis in the city. And thus, the events of Resident Evil 3 and 2 happen. Now, note that most likely some of these things were changed or altered or slightly retconned or whatever later. Because even during the development of Outbreak, uh, which added a lot of smaller stories to the Raccoon City incident and some of the politics behind it, some things might have been rethought. And by now, some of the things that Kawamura-san wrote for Resident Evil 3 might be different or completely it different. Looks like we're ready to go. But Here, it is interesting this. to see how much of a backstory was created for okay. These uh, events and Nikolai how most of these are rather implied or hinted on in the locations and files of the game rather than just outright stated. Let's go. But, anyways, uh, this is half of the game done, and this is everything that I really wanted to talk about done. Um, I hope it was interesting to learn if you didn't know about it and you weren't bored if you did know about it. Um, I still advise you to uh, go and read the interview and some of the stuff from uh, Project Umbrella website because they did have a lot of really interesting stuff about the development of the games and some behind the scenes things. But for now, I will be leaving you with this most interesting failure of the uh, live selection because it does absolutely nothing. Um, it is the only live selection that does literally nothing at all if you fail it. It just puts you in the same um, location as if you use the... Uh, uh, emergency break and from what I've noticed there is absolutely no changes in the gameplay afterwards and it also does zero damage to you like you you don't get damaged even though it's hard to understand how Jill did not get damaged there but well she didn't also despite the it, it's basically just a combination of both animations for uh, Carlos and Jill from two different versions of the same live selection cutscene. But it changes nothing. Carlos, I don't believe it. You're alive! I'm not sure how we're gonna get out of this town. What are you talking about? We made it! You don't get it. They have no intention of letting us make it back alive. Do you really think we can trust their great evacuation plan? Huh, it's just a piece of paper. But we don't have any other choice than to trust them right now. No, if we're gonna die, then we should get to choose when it happens. So that's it then, huh? You're giving up? No. I just... I can't handle it. So yeah, I will be leaving you with the rest of the playthrough. And in the very, very end of it, there will be uh, PlayStation credits this time around. Because they are a bit different uh, from the PC version and especially the PC version re-release. Uh, in short, they are different in that they actually sound better. In a way that um, the music is actually synchronized with the length of the credits. The music ends as the credits end. 
while in PC version the music ends and then there's still like a few minutes of credits because the credits are longer. But apart from that you can still see some of the stuff that I haven't shown before. I will be uh, doing the timestamps for every a little thing that uh, you might have not known or seen before and uh, I couldn't show in the previous full playthroughs uh, so you just you know in case you don't want to watch it in full you can obviously view this entire thing without me talking and listen to the uh, beautiful sounds of Gatling guns shooting everywhere which is unnecessarily loud usually but other than that, this is it. This is the end of the commentary for this episode. And the next episode will be the final big episode in this LP. I will be finally finishing it. And I will show a lot of actually neat stuff that you might not know. Including some rather weird things. And uh, showing off all the epilogues, showing what kills you in the game, what doesn't, and stuff like that. So thanks for hanging out with me all this time, and I will see you in the next episode. See ya!
October 1st, night. I woke up to the sound of falling rain. I can't believe I'm still alive. appears to be a slight fracture in his right arm just below the elbow. However,
Monster. Uh, I've got some bad news. Nikolai's still alive. But I thought he was dead. <laughs> that guy doesn't know the meaning of the word dead. What is he after? I don't know. All I know is that he is our enemy. I'm sorry, Jill, but there's something I gotta take care of. I promise I'll meet up with you later. But don't worry.
I'm quite
Beginning of operation in three minutes. Please evacuate immediately. Stars. I am not going to give up! Jill! That's it. We've got to find a way out of here. Now! Warning. Missile. System. Checking battery. Warning. There is not enough power to activate the system. Battery connected.
system overheating. Enter cooldown mode. about don't you hear that there's a second chopper and it's here to rescue you but who is it who could possibly be looking for me it doesn't matter we just have to be there when it lands It's here! It's time to go! Now we have a rather unfortunate turn of events. It seems that the President and the Federal Council have passed judgment over the civilians of Raccoon City. The President and Federal Council have ruled that the Bacalus Terminate operation is the best course of action for this extreme situation and have since executed. Based on that fact, Raccoon City has been literally wiped off the map. Current reports have the death toll surpassing the 100,000 mark. Hearts go out to those poor civilians of Raccoon City.